Let us pray. Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study once again today. We thank you because of this privilege you give us. Thank you because of the value of the privilege. And thank you because you have granted us the privilege of paying the price to be here on Monday and to study the word of God together. We pray, Lord, that the sacrifices we make and the price we are paying and are coming up and down so that we can study your word together that these sacrifices will not be in vain in Jesus name we're asking oh Lord that tonight you grant us the abundance of your spirit so that your spirit himself will teach us from your word in Jesus name I pray that you open our eyes to see our hearts to understand a spirit to believe and to stand upon this word which will never fail we pray Lord that you strengthen us as we study your word let it be nourishment to our soul and spirit thank you Lord because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray Amen. we come once again to our Bible study tonight and we're still in 2nd Peter chapter 1 we have already studied from verse 1 all through to verse 7. I need to reveal with you. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. You'll see how Peter the apostle introduced himself. Number one he said, I am a servant. And number two he said, I am an apostle. On the one hand it shows humility. On the other hand it shows his dignity. And you have the combination of that humility and dignity coming together, forming the man, making the man, making him the minister that he ought to be. In the side, on the side of Christ, a servant to Christ. On the side of the church, of the people of God, an apostle of Christ unto the church so you see it's one thing to Christ a servant and it's another thing to the church and apostle grace and peace is said be multiplied unto you he wants us to have a multiplicity of grace and of the peace of God how do we have that peace every time peace in the storm and peace in every situation and the grace of God that is able to get you through and make you to be able to withstand whatever takes place on earth how do you have that multiplicity of the grace of God and of the peace of God is through the knowledge of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ and then he tells us according as his divine power he has given unto us all things pertaining unto life and godliness through the knowledge once again of him that has called us to glory and to virtue he tells us that his divine power his mighty power, his omnipotent power, his unfailing power has made available for us all things pertaining to life. Life here, life physical, life spiritual, life eternal. In all the battles of life, he has given unto us everything that we need that will make us a success. Not only that, it's life and godliness. All things pertaining to godliness, he has made available as well. How are we going to claim them? How are we going to have them? Through the knowledge. That's why we come here every time. It is through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, him who has called us unto glory and unto virtue as to study the word of God. And you know more about God. And you know more about Christ. And you know more about the Holy Spirit. And you know more about the promises of God, the provision of God, the power of God. Everything made available for you. That's how you'll be able to have the victory and the enjoyment and the experience of what the Lord has called you to whereby he said in verse 4 are given unto us what is given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these great and exceeding and precious promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature you lose the old man the nature of the devil and then the nature of God the nature of Christ comes into you having escaped the corruption the pollution the perversion the evil the sinfulness and the all the degradation that is in the world through laws then after all that after showing the provision of god and the promise of god 
and the power of God and everything made available for us in the kingdom as we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son and we become partakers of this divine nature then he tells us you have a part to play and the part you have to play he tells us from verse 5 beside this beside the divine power beside the divine provision beside the precious promises beside the sovereignty of god and the power of god and everything that christ has made available beside this at giving all diligence add to your faith he wants us to understand that a christian life is not a passive life if we're going to grow and if we're going to move up in our christian life it's not a passive life passive christians they cannot grow eventually they will backslide it tells us add and you see when it says add it's a commandment it's an imperative it's not a suggestion it's not something well i will do it when i have time it says you give all diligence you make all necessary efforts to add to the foundation of faith. Then he mentions seven things that were to us. Number one, virtue. Number two, knowledge. Number three, temperance. That's self-control. Number four is patience. Number five, godliness. Number six, brotherly kindness. Number seven, charity. It says these seven things, these seven characteristics, you are to add to the faith. You are already partakers of that like precious faith. What you are to do now is to add onto that foundation of faith. And it's not an option. It's a necessity. And it is compulsory. Salvation is of God's grace. And yet there remains the human responsibility. The growth and the stability of the Christian life is dependent upon God and his power. Yet each of us as Christians, we must be diligent in making our calling and election sure. Those who leave the spiritual growth and progress to God alone. And they say, well, God will help me. God will make me grow. God will sanctify me. God will fill me with the Holy Ghost. God will do everything there is to be done in my Christian life. Those who leave the growth of their life and the stability of their spiritual life to God alone without being diligent in prayer, diligent in personal devotion, and diligent in study, and diligent in fellowship and obedience. Those people, they experience stagnancy and retrogression. That means backsliding. That means then divine provision on the one hand, human cooperation on the other hand. And those two must have a scriptural, spiritual balance. One side, God's sovereignty. On the other side, man's responsibility, human responsibility. I need to tell you this, it's very important. On the one side, you have God's provision and God's power and God's goodness and God's mercy and everything that God has made available for his own children that's one side of the story on the other side of the story here is human responsibility man's responsibility what God says he will do yes he can do but he lays the onus on you and the responsibility on you and that's why we just we didn't just sit back home and say God wants me to grow God loves my growth and God delights in my obedience and God delights in my having knowledge of the word of God but we came here we made an effort we're trying to be diligent so that we can balance the sovereignty of God with the responsibility of man let me show you in the word of God and if you don't balance those two things together that's where people have problems and let me show you in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5 and verse 31 Acts chapter 5 and in verse 31 here he's talking about his repentance and he's telling us here this repentance is actually the work of God in verse 31 him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins he that's his sovereign power. That's his great power. He gives repentance to the people of God. But do you know in the same Acts of the Apostles, he puts the responsibility on you. He wants to give you repentance. He can do it. That's his power. 
But then he gives you the precept and he tells you, you are to do something about it. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17, I'm reading to you from Bastachi, from Bastachi. And the times of this ignorance got winked at. But now, commanders all men everywhere to do what? To repent. You will see on the one hand, God gives repentance. On the other hand, it's your responsibilities. In um, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, reading verses 12 and 13. I want you to see the two parts. On the side of God, there's something to do. He works. On your own side, there's something you need to do. You need to work. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, much more, in my absence. Listen to this now. Listen to this now. This is your responsibility. Work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation of fear and trembling. Look at the next verse. For it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You have the balance there. God walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. On the other hand, you have the responsibility of working out your salvation with fear and trembling uh, look at this in Romans chapter 6 Romans chapter 6 in Romans chapter 6 verses 18 and 19 it says be being then made free from sin we became ye became the servants of righteousness it says that's what God has done God has made you free God has set you free and he has set you free from sin and you have become the servants of righteousness that's God's part in verse 18 that's what God has done that's God's power that's God's purpose that's God's provision but look at verse 19 I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and for iniquity unto iniquity even so now here is your responsibility you your members as servants to righteousness unto holiness on the one side there is a promise of God and on your own side as a human being there's something you do about it Acts of the Apostles chapter 27 Acts chapter 27 I'm reading to you from verse 22 Acts 27 verse 22 and now I exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the sheep for there stood by me this night the angel of god whose i am and whom i serve saying fear not paul thou must be brought before caesar and look god has given thee all them that sail with thee look at that promise of god and see what god is saying unto paul he said paul don't be afraid you will not lose your life. In fact, all the people that are sailing with you, I've given them to you. There will be no loss of any life. Wherefore, such be of good cheer in verse 25, for I believe God that it shall be, even as it was told me. But do you understand that as the ship was going, then some of the people that were helping to sail the ship, they wanted to abscond and run away. After all, everybody is safe. Everybody is secured. Almighty God has promised, and Paul has given us confirmation. I believe God, it shall be, even as it was told me. And then in verse 20, in verse 30, and as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, so that they will not direct the ship anymore, and they will not sail the ship anymore. After all, God has promised that all these people sailing with Paul, their lives are secured. There is no problem. There will be no loss of any life. So the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea under color, pretending as though they would have cast anchors out of the four ship. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. And do you see here the two sides we're talking about? Do you see here God's sovereignty and the promise of God and the power of God? And do you see the other side of it, which is man's responsibility? And as the reason, as you come to Second Peter, and it tells you that according as his divine power, 
he has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness and then because of that we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws and we become partakers of the divine nature then he said don't relax then just sit down there and do nothing and say everything is all right because according as his divine power he has given me all things full stop now beside this giving all diligence add to your faith what are you going to add virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity which is love then he tells us in what we're studying today from verse 8 all through to verse 11 verse 8 look at your bible second peter chapter 1 for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ but he that lacketh these things that is all these things were to add to our christian life and to our christian experience he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his own sins wherefore the rather brethren give diligence make effort do everything necessary give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if ye do these things ye shall never fall on the basis that you are diligent you are making effort and you are not taking your christian life for granted and you are adding all these characteristics of the christian life you are adding to your foundation of faith on that basis if ye do these things ye shall never fall for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our lord Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There are three points we are going to consider today as we look at this study. Number one, steadfast believers equipped with essential knowledge. As, and as a kind of knowledge which is not essential. A kind of knowledge, earthly knowledge, human knowledge, philosophical knowledge, psychological knowledge, all the knowledge you gather from society superstitious knowledge all those ones are not essential but it's a kind of knowledge which is essential very central and very indispensable that you need in your life that's why he talks about steadfast believers equipping themselves with essential knowledge and then point number two short-sighted backsliders empty of evangelical knowledge short-sighted backsliders that are empty of evangelical knowledge that's why it says he that lacketh these things they lack the knowledge evangelical knowledge and evan evangelical truth that they ought to have so that they'll be able to grow in their christian lives is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that was purged from his soul since then number three the sure basis of entering the everlasting kingdom the sure basis of entering the everlasting kingdom i come back to point number one said first believers equipped with essential knowledge and you see how this verse it begins for if these things be in you and abound not only that you have them what's he talking about if these things oh he's mentioned oh, he's referring to what he had just said the virtue and the knowledge and the temperance and the patience and the godliness and the brotherly kindness and the charity that's what he's referring to if all these things be in you and they are not just stagnant remaining at the same level and they grow and they increase and they abound they make you that you will not be barren spiritually or non fruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ the existence of these things in our lives the fruit of the spirit and the increase of them that's the evidence that our knowledge of christ is working effectually in us bearing the fruit of the spirit shall be the priority of every christian because it says we give all diligence and as we give all the diligence we're adding up 
we're adding all those characteristics in our lives as we bear the fruits and make that priority we understand and that's the, that's the reason why in timothy chapter 6 verse 11 paul the apostle talking to that man of god said follow after righteousness pursue righteousness run after righteousness until you're able to possess and experience and manifest and grow it out in your life you follow after righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and meekness you know what paul is telling us that religious activities they still leave us barren and unfruitful in the sight of god in the evaluation of god if our lives are not full of these abundant virtues of the christian life and if we're not enriched with them then uh, we will just be unfruitful but being being fruitful is not merely getting involved in you know evangelism christian work christian activity it means being filled with the fruit of righteousness bringing forth the fruit meat for repentance possessing the fruit of the spirit which is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness and temperance in short it's being like christ in character that's real fruitfulness and he's saying we must seek this more than any other thing on earth look at that verse 8 again it says for if these things be in you and abound stop there for a moment these things be in you and abound in second corinthians chapter 8 Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. In Second Corinthians 8, 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything. What do you mean, Paul? In faith, in utterance, and in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us. See that ye abound in this grace also. The grace of giving. He wants us, and not just to have the sin but you possess them in abundant measure it tells us in colossians chapter 3 colossians chapter 3 remember what he's telling us he wants us to have them to increase them and to abound in them colossians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 12 put on therefore as the elect of god holy and beloved by wells of mercies kindness humbleness of mind meekness long suffering did you hear that here paul is telling was telling the believers he said you'll be risen with christ that's what the lord has done you are dead that's in verse 3 of that same chapter that's what the lord has done now you need to mortify and kill and destroy all your members on the earth fornication adultery and all those negative things and then now he said put on as the elect of god holy and beloved by wells of mercies put it on make it a deliberate thing in your life and in kindness make it deliberate in your life practical kindness it is and humbleness of mind make it a deliberate thing and meekness lowliness as well as patience and long suffering then in verse 14 it says above all these all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfection and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful and let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing how tell me out loud uh, do you hear that those of you that sing it says when you sing with the grace of god for the grace of God with Christian virtue that's what is acceptable in the sight of God singing with grace in your heart to the Lord uh, you know uh, they asked a particular preacher and he said when you prepare your sermon you prepare your message and you're trying to give that message who do you try to please as you are giving the message oh he said I'm giving the message to please God and once i please god then he can use that message in any way he wants in the hearts of the hearers and we need to talk to the singers too when you sing who do you sing to you sing to the lord and then he can use that song any way he wants but if you are singing unto man and if you are singing because of man then you sing it anyhow but it says you sing singing with grace in your heart unto the lord and then in verse 17 it says and whatsoever ye do in word or deed not only singing not only preaching 
whatsoever you do, not only in the church, even outside the church. And whatsoever you do, in word or indeed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. And those are steadfast believers, they grow in the knowledge of the Lord in Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more. You know what Peter was saying where, where we're looking at? If these things be in you and abound. And here he's telling us, and this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that she may approve the things that are excellent, that she may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. That's what he wants. He wants these good things to abound in us. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, For this cause we also, since, we, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul the apostle telling the Colossians, he said, since we heard about you coming to Christ, it is something that has been uppermost in our hearts. We do not want you to just be at the same level when you are born again. And just to be a baby, a baby Christian, after 10 years, after 15 years, after 20 years of knowing the Lord, that your knowledge will not go beyond the level of a baby Christian. He said, since we heard of you, there is one thing we have been persistently talking about, talking to, uh, talking to God about you, that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Fruitful in every good work. Fruitful in every good work. You know what that means? That whether it's a Monday or it's a Sunday, or it's a Tuesday, or it's a Thursday, or it's a Wednesday, or it's a Friday, or it's a Saturday, any day, anything you are doing like this for the kingdom of God, fruitful. And you do not allow your pain, your problem, your hangover, and what you're experiencing in your family, and what you're experiencing in your place of work, you do not allow that to cloud your vision and to disturb your fruitfulness that in everything that you do and you do not allow your relationship with one another or misunderstanding with one another to affect the work the product and the output of your christian life that in everything he says in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of god strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness chapter 2 of colossians from verse 6 as ye have therefore received christ jesus the lord so walk ye in him rooted and built up in him established in the faith as ye have been taught abounding remember what peter is telling us if these things be in you and abound and here paul is saying the same thing to the uh, to the colossians it says rooted built up in him established in the faith as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving in verse 9 for in him dwelleth all fullness of the godhead bodily and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power it tells us then that uh, we were just to keep on bearing fruit and we're to abound in that fruit more and more and more and more in first thessalonians chapter 4 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received us, how ye as received from of us, how ye ought to walk and how to please God. Or if you're a true preacher, that's what you are telling people how to please God. If you're a good counselor, that's what you're telling people how to please God. If you're a good advisor, that's what you're telling people how to, how to please God. If you're a good moderator, that's what you're telling people how to please God. If you're a good friend and you're talking to your friend, do this, do this, do this. If you're a good friend, 
That's what we are telling people. How to please God. That's what the apostle said here. He said, how you received of us, how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. That's what he wants for a Christian life. And that's what uh, you ought to understand. And that's what you ought to demonstrate in your Christian life. How you will increase in these virtues. How you will abound in these virtues. And then he tells us in verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Ah, if you're a real Christian, the Spirit of God abiding in you, We'll be teaching you how you love one another. It says you'll be taught of God. When you have hatred, my friend, who is teaching you? When you have jealousy, who is teaching you? When you have retaliation and revenge, who is teaching you? When you have love, we know it's God teaching us. God cannot teach us hatred, revenge, retaliation, malice, bearing grudge, fighting, God doesn't teach his children that there's somebody else teaching you that but here he says as you have been taught of God what have we been taught of God in that verse 9 as touching brotherly love you don't need that we come to you and be telling you again you've been taught of God how to love one another and then in verse 10 and indeed you do it toward all the brethren which I all Macedonia, but we're begging you now, we're pleading with you now, we're beseeching you now, brethren, that he increase more and more. And that's what he wants. He wants us to increase more and more. He wants us to bear fruit. He wants the, the fruit to increase in our lives. In Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. I'm looking at verses verse 14. Titus chapter 3. Verse 14. And let us also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. If we don't have good works, all these things, virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity, if we don't have them, we'll be unfruitful. And will be barren that's why it says let ours the people who associate with us the people who say they're children of god the people who say they are members of a bible church let them learn to maintain you've got it before maintain it and sometimes maintenance is is a real issue I mean, i'm sure you, you are living in some houses built by some landlords and those landlords they don't maintain those houses and how inconvenient we feel. That's how inconvenient we feel when you don't maintain the good works, the virtue that you had before, and the knowledge when you don't maintain it, and the temperance when you don't maintain it, and the patience when you don't maintain that. You had it before, but you don't maintain it. As your landlord does not maintain the house and it's leaking, and lizards are coming in through the cracks. And the windows are dilapidated because the landlord is not maintaining it and you feel inconvenient when you don't maintain that patience that godliness that brotherly kindness and that charity that love that's how inconvenient we feel let ours then learn how to maintain all these fruit of the spirit that we've learned about in john chapter 15. john Chapter 15. I'm reading verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth what? Look up here. You know, uh, I grew up um, when I was very young, and I, and I would see those farmers climbing up the palm tree and cutting off some of the branches and you see they will cut off those branches is because uh, those branches were not serving any useful purpose uh, but they were taking the sap and the nutrient out of the palm tree and so the farmers will climb up and cut them off prune them so that that tree may bring forth more fruit 
And I used to think to myself, and I'm still thinking even now aloud, if those palm trees can talk while the farmers are cutting, what do you think those palm trees will say? Tell me. Leave me alone. Why are you cutting me like that? Don't you know it is painful? And I'm the farmer. And you are the tree. And God is using me like a cutlass. And this thing in your life that is not bearing fruit, I cut it. That one in your life that is not bearing fruit, I cut it. That impatience in your life that is not bearing fruit, I cut it. And that kind of critical spirit that is not bearing fruit, I cut it. Because, not because I hate you, not because God hates you, because he wants you to bear more fruit. But because you are not like that palm tree, because you are a human being, leave me alone. Why are you talking like that? It is painful. Don't you know when you talk like that in the public uh, concerning me, don't you know how painful it is? It's because God wants you to bear more fruit. Everything that happens to you, and as you come in here, and we're teaching the word of God, we didn't come here to play, we come to prune you, to cut off all those redundant and useless parts of your life. And sometimes when we're teaching here, one thing or the other in the teaching, maybe the approach, maybe the quotation, maybe the explanation, maybe the application, maybe the time that is taken, may inconvenience you. But that's the pruning. And when God is pruning you, and it's not convenient for you, you better stay where you are and let him do the pruning. Because at the end, you'll be able to bear more fruit. That's why it says, look at verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that he may bring forth more fruit. And then he tells us from verse 5, it says, And the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, is cast forth as a branch. And then it says, And it's withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Then it says here, it is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciples. I pray will bear more fruit in Jesus' name. We're back to 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, I've been looking at verse 8 that says, If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then it says in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. He can see a little, but he cannot see afar off. He is short sighted. Well, eventually, if he doesn't correct that spiritual vision that is getting dim, if he remains adamant in that condition of spiritual short-sightedness, he's going to become blind spiritually. He that lacketh these things is blind, I cannot see afar off. And he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He was purged from his old sins. And because he was purged from his old sins, at that time when he was purged, he was a believer. But now, because he has forgotten that experience that he had before, he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins, he's backsliding and he's blind. And he cannot see a far off. He's short-sighted. And that's the reason we titled this second part, Short-Sighted Backsliders empty of evangelical knowledge and let's look at some of ex- some examples and illustrations in the scriptures to back that up in luke chapter 8 luke chapter 8 reading from verse 13 luke chapter 8 verse 13 they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these having no root which for a while believe they believe for some time for a while believe and then it says, in time of temptation, fall away. And they that which fall, which fell among sons, are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. You can see it yourself. And you can see the reason why I make all the noise I make, because some people call it noise against the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches 
and the lust for other things entering in those things that were not there before you see there is still one you know shouting and preaching and you know talking quoting many many scriptures because if you have believed the lord and you say you are a child of god and you allow those things to come in they'll make you unfruitful and they'll make you barren spiritually and you'll not be able to bring any fruit unto perfection in revelation revelation chapter 2 revelation chapter 2 you know the danger of knowing god and then not taking care of your spiritual life and then finding out that eventually you lose all the good things that you have revelation chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 2 i know thy works and i labor and i patience and now thou canst not bear with them which are evil and can and as tried thou hast tried them which say the apostles and are not and has found them liars and has born and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted nevertheless i have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love and you see what the lord is saying here he says i see your activities i see your labor i see your perseverance I see your sound doctrine. I see your separation from false prophets. I see all that. I see your loyalty. I see your faithfulness. And I see your consecration. And I see your commitment. But there's something lacking here. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. That warm love, warm fellowship, that excitement in the presence of God, that joy in the service of the Lord that is not just, uh, that is not a, a kind of a forced service, that is not a kind of drudgery. That I'm just doing it because I have to do it. The love is missing. I see the activity. But I do not see the, the, the love being injected into that activity. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Then Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. And you know, sometimes you, you find some, you know, so-called Christians, they have believed the Lord. And you remember the days when they were joyful in the service of the Lord, excited to belong to a church like this. You will know the time when in their heart the excitement will make them run to the house of god and it doesn't matter what is going on what they are facing in their place of work when they come to the house of the lord it's like let's build here three tabernacles one for you one for moses and one for, one for elijah that we will never leave here we we'll just remain here and remain here and remain here you know the time that time of excitement and that time of joy and that time when it appeared that the nobody could take that thing away from you but you know, after some years you know we'll walk slowly and walk gently and it's like you know we have to do it we have no choice and we're just there and if there is any chance anybody making a mistake saying why are you doing it like that get out you will not do it again ah inside us <laughs> they have relieved me i'm even happy now i am free now i don't have to do this thing anymore you know that situation neither cold totally outside nor hot totally inside and jesus said i know your works because you are lukewarm you are neither cold nor hot the excitement is not as it ought to be that's why it says in verse 17 there because thou says i am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked you see the condition of the people there although they think they have spirit they have material things material wealth but it says they really didn't have what they ought to have that's why peter was telling the people that if you lack these things the faith and the virtue the knowledge and the temperance the patience and the godliness the brotherly kindness and the charity if you lack these things then you are blind and you cannot see afar off and you are forgotten that you are washed and purged and purified from your old sins and let's see this boy here an illustration of what peter was saying in luke chapter 15 luke chapter 15 
reading from verse 12. Luke chapter 15, verse 12. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance without us living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have fed, he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave it to him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my of, of how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to eat and to spare? And I perish with hunger here. You see the condition of that young man. He had everything when he was in the house with the father, when he was love and fellowship. And everything was made available for him. But then the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes. He looked afar and he thought, the fields are greener outside. Let me go. And then he left. And by the time he left, all the things he had, all the resources he had, he had wasted everything. And he came to penury. And he didn't have anything again. And he said, I'm even worse now than the servants of my father so that's the reason why the lord is calling upon us to wake up and to understand that he wants us to maintain all that he has given unto us in first timothy chapter 6 first timothy chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 3 if any man teach otherwise and consent not to hold some words even the words of our lord jesus christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strives of words whereof cometh envy and strife and railings and evil surmising perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself you know the people that really do not have the real thing anymore all that remain is just you know some pretended uh, kind of outward righteousness the inner righteousness is gone is no more there in ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 from verse 17 this i say therefore and testify in the lord that ye henceforth walk not as other gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. You remember, you remember where we're coming from? He that lacketh these virtues, these characteristics, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And because of that blindness, he has even forgotten that was purged from his own sins. That's why he's saying here, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to walk all on godliness, on cleanness with greediness. And in Second Peter, a pathetic state, pathetic state. In Second Peter chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 20, look at the condition of these people. They knew the Lord before, but they are backsliding. They were fervent for the Lord before, but now they are lukewarm. And they were free from sin before, but now sin is their master, and sin is their Lord. And the flesh they had overcome before, they could not overcome the flesh now. See their final condition in Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It says they escaped before the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were saved. And they knew Jesus as their Savior. But now they are again entangled in the corruptions of the world, in the dancing, in the drinking, in the merriment, in the movies of the world. The things they were free from before, now... They are entangled again in them. The fornication they were free from before. The adultery they were free from before. And the society pollution they were free from before, they become again entangled in them. They are backsliding and they are short-sighted. They still go to church and they think everything is all right. 
It says, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them, in verse 21, not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the only commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened in verse 22. It's happened unto them. According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his vomit again. And he saw the pig that was washed to a wallowing in the mire. And that's why the Lord is telling us, you make up your mind, you will not backslide. In Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Now, the just shall live by faith, but if any man, worker, leader, preacher, member, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back. I said, we are not of them who draw back. Ah, yeah. uh, whatever the temptation, we can overcome. Whatever the persecution, we can overcome. Whatever the trial and trouble, we can overcome. Whatever the opposition coming from the world, we can overcome. The grace of God is sufficient for you. That's why it says, but we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And that's why the Lord is telling us here that we need to keep a Christian virtue. We need to keep a Christian character. And it's on that level, on that foundation, we'll be marching on and moving on. But the personal basis is assurance of salvation on the testimony of 13 years ago, 17 years ago, 19 years ago, I was saved. I was saved. I was high about today. The personal basis is assurance of salvation only on the testimony of the past. It's short-sighted and is ignorant of true scriptural assurance. It has no clear view and proper perception of the nature and the requirements of the gospel. That's why the text is saying he cannot see afar off. That is, he does not have clear, distinct spiritual vision. He does not comprehend the purpose of the gospel. Neither does he know the power of godliness working in the believer. And then the, that verse says he has forgotten that he was even purged from his own sins. His sins were forgiven and purged, but he has forgotten that blessed Christian experience, the peace and the joy and the victory that he once had, he had lost everything. He has forgotten what it means to have the assurance of sins forgiven. And how it feels to have the peace of God and to live without guilt and without condemnation. In short, it's backsliding. And it's only carrying on religion without righteousness. And what does the Bible say? Godliness without cont uh, with contentment is great gain. I need to tell you that contentment without godliness is a great loss. And if you've lost your godliness and righteousness, and you are shallow, just carrying the shell about without the treasure of the grace of God in your life, what a terrible condition you are in. Now I come to point number three. The sure basis of entering the everlasting kingdom. The sure basis of entering the everlasting kingdom. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10, verses 10 and 11, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. If ye do these things, we're well, not just to sit passively at the Bible study. And then hear everything that the Lord is teaching us uh, through the word and by his spirit. And then after the whole teaching, we just stay passively there. And then we go back home and there is no change. There is something to do. That's why it says, if you do these things, you are you, diligent to make your calling and your election sure. It's only then an entrance will be granted unto you abundantly to enter into the everlasting kingdom. Of course, when you talk about entering the kingdom, you know that's a narrow way. Narrow way. Uh, many preachers and churches and fellowships and assemblies and what have you today, uh, they're they recommending the broad way. The broad way. Do as you like, you'll still get to heaven. It's a narrow way that leads to heaven. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be 
which go in they are at because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it well you remember that when some advisors come to you and tell you to take it easy you remember when some of those deceived counselors when they come to you and they advise you and counsel you to take it easy will you remember this when those false preachers when they come to you and they try to tell you deeper life is making it hard <laughs> what are we making hard what i'm reading to you is the verse of scripture what is hard here what i'm telling you is what the scripture is saying that the broad way the way of liberty the way of freedom the way of, of do as you like the way of no control the way of no restraint the way of no restriction the way of drink if you want to drink the way of smoke if you want to smoke the way of fornication whatever you do nobody will talk they're too hard in that place this little thing don't do that this little thing don't do that they're too hard there it's too narrow that's the word of god and when they come to you recommending the broad way the way of do as you like and maybe you have not gone to join them but although you are here it's do as you like liberty freedom nobody will tie me down nobody will control my life no bible teaching will change me i will do what i want to do that's what i'm telling you that's the way the broad way that leads to destruction because it says stretch is a gauge and narrow is the way that leads unto life eternal and so it says if you are diligent and you follow this one that controls your life it says that's the only time you'll be granted abundant entrance into the kingdom of god in second timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 verse 19 it says here nevertheless the foundation of god standeth sure having the seal the lord knoweth them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of christ depart from iniquity everyone that nameth the name of christ should depart from iniquity not because of me change your attitude not because of me you're not living a righteous life because of me you are not living a life of self-control temperance because of me because of yourself to be able to get to heaven so that you can follow the narrow path and still be able to make it that's the reason why in hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 and we desire that every one of you no exception every one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end as you have been diligent before you keep on you are making the effort and you are diligent unto the very end verse 19 which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast which entereth into that within the veil chapter 22 of revelation revelation chapter 22 revelation chapter 22 verse 14 blessed are they that do his commandments it's one thing to know the commandments of god is another thing to do them blessed are they that do his commandments and that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city and that's the only way we can enter you come back to second uh, peter chapter 3 verse 14. second peter chapter 3 verse 14 wherefore beloved see that ye look for such things be diligent do you see how many times the word diligent diligent or diligence you know is coming up that she may be found of him in peace without sport without blame blameless if you look at your life today how is it does your conscience still bear witness with you that's not okay correct it that's not okay correct it until you become without sport and without blame in second timothy chapter four second timothy chapter four verse seven and verse eight i have fought a good fight i have finished my cause 
I have kept the faith. Here Paul the Apostle looked at his ministry and looked at his life. And looked at his experience and profession before the Lord. And he looked at it in three ways. Number one, as, um, as a soldier, I fought a good fight. He put on the armor of God and he fought a good fight as a good Christian soldier. Number two, as an athlete, I finished my course. He knew he was running a race. And he put aside all weight and every hindrance that will not allow him to run properly. And he said, I ran, not as beating the air, as a spiritual athlete, I have finished my course. And then as a steward, I've kept the faith. What the Lord gave unto me as a steward to go and serve unto the people. I've done it well and I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also, that love is appearing. Well, we need grace to be able to have all this grace. And that's what you need to pray for before you go back home. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Maybe you've got, you are saved already. That, that's initial experience of salvation. Our final salvation is of great importance. And that ought to demand the highest diligence and to arouse us to the most earnest efforts to keep on maintaining our relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why where we're studying in text second Peter, it says, Wherefore the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Yes, we know it's God that calls, and it's God that converts, and it's God that chooses those who repent and, uh, and, and believe. That is, you repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the Lord will see that, uh, will see that genuineness of repentance, and that thoroughness of repentance. And when the Lord sees that, you turn away from all your sins, and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then he chooses you, and he brings you into the kingdom of God, and it's a change of life. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. And then after he has chosen you, and you become a member of the body of Christ, a child of God, you live the Christian life. You live the Christian life in the day and in the night, anywhere and everywhere. And you're doing everything to put your flesh under control. To put your tongue under control and then to overcome the temptations of your life that's being diligent to make sure that your election does not fail and you don't play religion you're not interested in religion all you want is that the righteousness of god will remain and abide in you having that experience of god's forgiveness that's one thing having obtained a salvation that's one thing now the next thing is that you persevere in that grace of god to ensure that the eternal kingdom you are aiming at you are reaching onto that you reach there finally on the last day that's why you need to be diligent and persevere in faith faithfulness and persevere in fruit bearing now hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28 wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence, humility, honor, with reverence and, and what? Tell me out loud. Ah, this is where many people have failed. Godly fear. There are people that do not have any godly fear in their hearts anymore. They don't fear God anymore. Godly fear. Let's have grace. Don't just be coming and coming in vain. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God with reverence, humility of mind, and meekness. With reverence, with honor. That anywhere you are, you know God is watching you. He knows your life. He knows how you are reacting to temptation. Whether you are yielding or you are overcoming, let us serve God with reverence and godly fear. That's what the Lord is calling us to. And that's why Peter is, you know, saying all this and is telling us today, for if these virtues, these Christian characteristics be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but that he that lacketh all these things is blind 
and cannot see afar off, but he has forgotten that he was put from his own sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your own calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall, not, ye shall never fall, and then an entrance shall be manifested, ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Lord is preparing another kingdom. I will be there. Will you be there? I said, will you be there? Will you be there? More than coming to church, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Rise up and pray.